So what is the global IR? I define global IR in six dimensions. And these six dimensions, they're not exhaustive. There are maybe other dimensions you can bring in, but these are the crucial aspects of global IR. They're a little abstract, but I'll try to explain to you in a nutshell what I mean by them. First, what I call a pluralistic universalism, which basically means it's a universalism that accepts and builds on diversity. Now, the traditional idea of universal, when you talk about universal, very nice sounding term. It means, uh, you know, we go back to the period of uh, European enlightenment, when there's a one set of ideas that are seen as good for everybody. And it's very liberal to say that what is good for one is good for everybody. What is good for the hegemon is good for the rest of the world. What's good for America is good for the world. That means universalism is singular. So one set of ideas applied to all. If you don't accept those ideas, then you are a deviant. But that sort of universalism is what got us into where we are today, colonialism. Basically based on this idea that Western civilization was the most superior civilization and everybody else must accept it. Or the Westphalian model of state, nation state, is the only model out there that everybody should accept and applies to all. And if we can move forward in time, today we have ideas like a particular type of Western liberal democracy is good for everybody. A particular conception of human rights as property rights, individual rights, is good for everybody. Or the European Union is a model for the rest of the world. These are examples of what I call singular or monistic universalism. For global IR, true universalism is pluralistic, meaning that it accepts diversity. People and countries are going to be different. So there's not going to be one single model, one single international principle or institution applying to all. Differences will remain, but it's still possible to build common ground among countries and civilizations. Through cooperation, through interaction, you can find common ground while remaining different. It's kind of unity in diversity, although I don't think unity is the right word, but diversity is the right word. The world is not going to be a global village where everybody talks and acts in the same way. Even within democracy, even within capitalism, there will be variations. So the Chinese model of capitalism driven by state, the strong hand of the state, the state-controlled capitalism is very different from American-style capitalism where the state plays much less of a role, the market plays a more important role. And that's different from the European-style capitalism which is more has a social dimension to it. Similarly, we can talk about regionalism. The European Union is one kind of regionalism, integrated and uh, supranational. ASEAN is a different kind of regionalism. African Union is a different kind of regionalism. So regionalisms can vary, but they all aspire to regional cooperation. There is a common ground. There is a shared set of, uh, set of goals. But the way to realize those goals could be quite different. That doesn't mean the European Union is better than ASEAN or ASEAN is better than the African Union. The European Union has greater economic and political sort of uh, cooperation, supranational cooperation. Asia has less political cooperation. Its economic cooperation is driven by market. Africa has security cooperation increasingly, but very little economic cooperation. This is going to be all different. They all aspire to regionalism, meaning common prosperity for the regional members of the regional organization. So it is, regionalism is a universal concept, but it's not one single type of regionalism. So that's basically what pluralistic universalism is about. Instead of applying one model to all, 
accept diversity and try to find the common ground. So that's the first element of global IR. The second element of global IR would be that look for world history and not just a Greco-Roman or European or American history. So a lot of the theories and concepts, even the vocabulary we have of international relations today comes from either Greece, Rome or Europe and in the more modern period, the United States. So when you talk about democracy, we go about Athens. When you talk about balance of power, we also go to the Greek city-states. When you talk about ideas and norms, people also look at uh, Greek culture, Greek ideas. We talk about empire, we look at Roman empire as the origins of good empire, the prototype of a good empire. When you talk about balance of power, we have go back a little bit to the Greek uh, city-states, but mainly we look at Europe in the 17th, 18th, 19th, early 20th centuries. When you talk about state, we talk about nation state. And when you talk about hegemony, good hegemony, we talk about the United States after World War II. So our conception of international relations, our theories of international relations, are grounded in basically Western history, assuming that Greco-Roman history is Western, although Greece technically is not a Western civilization when it was at its peak. It was not a Christian country, it was a pagan country, it had a lot of interaction with the East. In fact, some of the most significant scientific and philosophical innovations of Greece happened in what is today Turkey, the Anatolia coast of Turkey. The Greeks were spread over, had a lot of interaction with uh, the East, borrowed a lot of ideas from Egypt and Sumer, including scientific ideas, and also a lot of political interaction, geopolitical interaction with Persia, the empire of Persia. So it was technically not a Western country as it is appropriated by the West today. It was appropriated as such. But the West claimed Greece, Rome had, had part of its heritage, then of course the post national European history, and then the American history after World War II, all becomes part of IR theory, the basis of IR theory. The global IR seeks to go beyond that and argues that one should also theorize from the histories of other cultures, other civilizations. So not European history, but world history or global history. So look at how the Chinese manage their state system. China is a quite, a, quite, a, quite a significant case here because it is not the oldest civilization, but it can claim to have, you know, among all countries, the most continuing or the single most continuous political system in the world. That much you have to accept. How did a country, such a large country, maintain it? Singular type of political system for so long. Why shouldn't we pay attention to that in building IR theory? Also, from India, you can find examples where, like Emperor Ashoka, King Ashoka, renounced war and accepted moral victory, the concept of moral victory, to maintain his empire. He did not give up his empire, but he renounced force. How can you maintain an empire without force? the power of moral beliefs. Why isn't that part of, we talk about constructivism, moral beliefs, moral ideas. Why can't we bring that in? But if you look at the original literature of constructivism, none of this includes the ideas of Ashoka. Only the Chinese have begun to think of their own history as the basis of constructivist writing. But I think more and more of that will be good. The first interstate system was not the Greek city-states, but it was the Amarna system in about 15th century BC, 14th, 15th century BC, involving Egypt and Assyria and uh, neighboring countries. They developed a process of diplomacy and we have records from that period. But no textbook in IR, or seldom we see any reference to the Amarna system of Egypt and Sumer and that area, Middle East, as the beginning of international relations. But there is a lot of opportunity to expand international relations by looking at world history. And that's the second element of global IR. The third element is very important. Global IR doesn't 
call for getting rid of existing theories, like realism, liberalism, constructivism. It's not talking about getting rid of them and basically reboot IR theory, invent something completely different. In fact, that would be unnecessary and unrealistic. Why unrealistic? Because, well, we have all these scholars and textbooks and universities in the West where international relations is still, uh, the, we still dominate the field of international relations. And that's a fact of life. Unless China, India, Indonesia, Myanmar, or Egypt and all can build institutions and theories, our scholars can develop scholarship to that extent, we have to live with these theories. That's one aspect of it. But really, not all IR theories are ignorant or oblivious to the non-Western world. There's actually a lot of variation and changes within IR theories, existing the mainstream theories in accepting non-Western world. Some are more ethnocentric, less ethnocentric, more accepting the non-Western cultures and histories than others. For example, I, I was talking about uh, earlier on about constructivism. Constructivism talks about culture and identity, so it gives an opening to the cultures and identities of non-Western countries. Technically, you can theoretically you can use constructivism to study the culture and identity of other countries. And that's why constructivism has become very popular, especially in China and especially actually around the world. Because scholars from different parts of the world, non-Western areas, they think through constructivism they can bring in their own culture and identity and civilization. So it gives them an opening. Though even if constructivism is a little ethnocentric, still Western-centric, but it has the potential, it makes allowances for bringing the rest in and there is increasing work in that, in, in that, in that uh, constructivist mode that addresses, that captures the voices and experiences of non-Western countries. Realism also has kind of a global pretensions at least. I mean, realism, uh, some realist scholars draw on non-Western scholars, non-Western thinkers like Kautilya or, uh, or uh, Sanju. And they talk about Westphalia like systems, like anarchic systems in warring states period. And uh, even in some, some historical periods of India. So, so realism also has some empathy for non Western ideas and is changing. Increasingly, realists actually look to China for inspiration. But China, they think, is a realist country. So people like John Muir Scheinberg, who is a leading realist scholar in the US and the world, thinks that he feels very much at home in China because he thinks Chinese are very realist. Now that may not be so true, but at least he feels that China is the place to draw and derive realist ideas. So realism is also changing and as accepting ideas from non-Western countries, but not quite to the way we would hope for. Liberalism is actually, in our sense, the theory that uh, is least accommodating of non-Western societies and cultures. Liberalism started basically from Europe through property rights, capitalism, and liberalism is the ideology of the United States. A lot of liberal thinking about international institutions, multilateralism, hegemonic stability comes from American foreign policy experience. And liberals believe that the rest of the world will become like them. So the United States can co-opt countries like China and India instead of being uh, different. So liberals have this sense, and if you read the work of people like John Eikenberg, very influential uh, liberal scholar of international relations, more or less, I mean, his, his view is more complicated than what I'm talking about when I'm, I'm presenting. But generally, the, he's optimistic that uh, the liberal order that the United States built would co-opt emerging powers like China and India instead of being challenged or, or revised by these rising powers. 
And liberalism still has its sense of distinctiveness, it's still a bit parochial when it comes to accepting the ideas and norms and institutions of other countries, non Western countries. Feminism is a sort of critical theory of international relations, and a lot of feminist scholars come from the non Western world. And they are very Impact, they have a lot of empathy for the voices and experiences of the non Russian world. Post colonialism, which is basically an Indian invention in many ways, just like Chinese have become either realist or constructivist, most Indians are post colonial scholars. They took, look to post colonial IR. Basically, they look at international relations from the prism of India's colonial experience and India's Indian society's evolution and the position as a post colonial state. Now, post-colonialism also about non-Western uh, civilizations and societies. In fact, it's a good example of how one can develop an IR theory from a non-Western world, except that post-colonialism doesn't go far enough in history to, to like, look at classical civilizations. That's a limitation. But my point is that not all IR theories ignore the West, uh, ignore the rest of the non-Western world. There are differences among them. And where the lag behind in accepting or incorporating the voices and experiences of non-Western countries, they are now beginning to accept it. They are changing. They are becoming broader. So that means we cannot call for replacing them. Forget about realism, forget about liberalism, forget about constructivism. Just start with something completely different, where there is non-Western IR theory of global IR. That's not what I'm arguing about. That's not what global IR is about. It subsumes. It basically says, hey, realists, liberals, liberals and constructivists, now what they say, what you say is, there is some truth to it, but you are still very, quite narrow. You should do more. You should bring in the experiences and histories and the contributions of non-Russian countries and civilizations more onto the plate, more onto your theoretical toolkit and broaden, enrich yourself. So it's not a call for replacing or displacing existing theories, but enriching them by infusing them with, the, with ideas and insights from the non-Western world. That's what global IR is about. It's not going to call for total replacement of existing theories, which, as I said, will be both impractical and also undesirable because these theories do have something to say and they're adapting to the growing prominence of the non-Western world. The fourth uh, aspect of global IR is regions. Regionalisms, regions and area studies. Now this is also very important. Let me start with uh, regions. In IR, again there is a globe bias, a globalist bias. And for an idea to have, to find its place in theory, to be recognized as a theoretical uh, idea or theoretical concept, it must have, tra it must travel beyond one country or one region. It must have some global relevance. That's kind of a, if it's only applicable to that region, then it's not theory. That's how there's a tendency to think like that among IR theories. And the study of regions is kind of marginalized for a long time. That is changing, but still, IR theory is more biased in favor of global processes, global institutions, than regional processes and regional institutions, or what is called regional subsystems. The Europeans have challenged that because of their strong tradition of regionalism, but Americans are not very interested in the study of regionalism the way. Europeans are we in Asia are in that sense. And area studies. In a lot of countries in the world, international relations basically means area studies, or international studies, as sometimes area studies is called. So that means if you're in a school of international relations, a school of international studies, you study Africa, you study Middle East, if you study America, you study Southeast Asia, even you study countries. In the traditional Asian area studies, if you study China, you become a China scholar. If you study Japan, you become a Japan scholar. Very rarely you can study both. 
if you study Southeast Asia, even within Southeast Asia, you become an Indonesian specialist, a Thai specialist, and a mini Myanmar specialist. There's fragmentation. But generally, because of these area studies scholars, because of their focus on countries and regions, those who are kind of mainstream IR scholars, at least in the traditional way, they look at area studies with a bit of disdain, bordering sometimes on, con on contempt even. But these area specialists, they all, all they care about is studying one country, one region, and spending their life studying its language, culture, traveling. They don't look beyond the region to generalize about the wider world. So there is a kind of a tension between area studies approach and the disciplinary approach to international relations, especially in the US. In other parts of the world, by the way, people are happy to have both. I mean, uh, uh, for example, if you st go to India, or most parts of Asia, area studies and disciplinary international relations, they coexist. In fact, international relations starts and rides in the back of area studies, in Asia at least. Global IR argues that you should overcome, you should forget about this false distinction between area studies and disciplinary IR. And you should bring area studies in. Area knowledge is very important. You should not dismiss area studies because of the focus of area, area study scholars on language, culture, and for studying in one country. But also urges them, the area studies should try to do comparative work. Compare countries or take a regional approach as opposed to a country approach. They should take a country approach, but sometimes try to go a little beyond that, be a bit less parochial. And more generally, it, it also asks international relations scholars to be tolerant because area specialists really have field knowledge. So instead of deductive theory, having a set of theoretical propositions and applying to the regions and using regions or areas simply as a place for testing their theories, they should actually go out there and they do a little, should do a little bit of what area specialists do. Study regions. So we are finding increasingly and encouragingly that IR scholars are traveling, not staying in the uh, you know, US or West, but actually going to countries, including countries which are of increasing interest, like India and China, and studying international relations there. Not development, international development. In the old days, IR scholars who went to the so-called non-Western or third world Going to study development. Today they are going to study all sorts of things. Talk about theory, learn about theory, learn about foreign policy, learn about security and the like. And that's good. So there is kind of a synthesis, a convergence between area studies and discipline-based international relations. And I would like to encourage more of that and get rid of this, forget this false distinction between area studies and discipline of international relations. Similarly, just because we have global IR doesn't mean regions and regionalisms are unimportant. unimportant. In fact, regions and regionalisms are building blocks of global order. And study of regions and regionalisms can provide very valuable, fresh, and new insights into how the world operates. As we have a proliferation of regions and proliferation of regionalisms, proliferation of regionalisms, and there's a growing salience of regions in a multiplex world when we have no longer have a bipolar order or a unipolar order. There is less dominance of one country or, or one power or two powers on regions. That means the global foreign uh, security, global security and international dynamics that is uh, basically created, managed and imposed by one power or two powers on the rest of the world is lifting. The overlay of global superpower rivalry, for example, has lifted because of the end of the Cold War. So regions are having more autonomy. Regions are having more play in the international system. And at the same time, regions are also getting linked with each other. So we have Asia-Europe summit. We have European Union developing all sorts of partnerships with the world. We have ASEAN relationship with Latin America, with Africa. So because of this regionalism and interregionalism, regions are coming into play in the world of world politics today. 
in the multiplex wall. This is in fact one of the key elements of what I call multiplex because multiplex involves different layers of interaction, global, regional, national, local. Whereas a multipolar world is mainly about great power interactions at the global level. So regions and regionalisms and area studies are very important. Area studies provides knowledge of regions. Regions are relatively autonomous, relatively, not completely, autonomous arenas or sites for building ideas and norms and playing out international politics in a microcosm. And they contribute to the global order in a very significant way. And you cannot simply remove them and say, this is area studies, this is regionalism, which I am in studying what happens at the global level. And uh, that's the fourth aspect of global IR. The next is uh, exceptionalism, avoiding exceptionalism. Now what is exceptionalism? That's the tendency to think a region or a country is unique. So unique that it has its own style of international relations, own process, and not, nothing can fit. No outside idea or concept can fit. So that uniqueness is the basis of theorizing about that region or country. So you find this very common among scholars in the developing world. They say, oh, India is so different, or Indonesia is so different, or China is so different, or Asia, the region, is so different from the West. Now, of course they are different, but we, these kind of scholars who talk about exceptionalism, or in that exceptionalist tone, they make a virtue out of this difference, like Asian values. Well, Asia is its own values, therefore it cannot relate to global human rights. Asians like society more than self, where the West is individualistic, Asians are more communal. Therefore, universal human rights of the kind being projected by West is not acceptable. Or Asia, even ASEAN way, pushed to the extreme. ASEAN as a way of doing things, therefore the European model doesn't apply. Well, there's some truth to it, and uh, as I have myself will admit, but that doesn't mean you cannot compare ASEAN and find common ground with African or even European ways. So instead of saying we are so different that nothing applies to us, we have to have our own theory. Everything is, everything coming from outside is irrelevant. That's that's uh, parochialism, and that's not also true. Sometimes countries use this for authoritarianism. So the Asian values debate uh, in Asia. Singapore, Malaysia, and uh, China promoted this idea that Asians are so unique because they are communal. There's a Confucian ethic. Society is more important than self. Asians are hardworking. They save more money. Therefore, this Western liberalism, human rights, uh, is not suitable for Asia. Well, who was talking like this? India was not talking like that. Japan was not talking like that. These are democracies. They were talking about Asian values. It's the authoritarian countries and leaders who are talking about Asian values. So exceptionalism means it's a, it becomes a pretext for authoritarianism at home. It also becomes a pretext for hegemony of a regional power. So if the Chinese today talk about uh, Asian solution to Asian problems. Xi Jinping made a statement last year which created a lot of stir in the West that Asia should find its own solution to its own problems. If Singapore says that, or Myanmar says that, people think that's fine. But if China says that, well, what is an Asian solution to Asian problem? It's a Chinese solution to an Asian problem. So it creates fear of Chinese dominance, justifiably so. All for that matter, when you talk about Japan during the second, uh, before the Second World War, Japan also championed Asian unity, Pan-Asianism. One variation of Japanese Pan-Asianism is Asia for Asians. And who is going to be the leader of that Asia? Japan. So Japan spread its own imperialism throughout Asia in the name of Asian unity. So be aware, I'm saying, about exceptionalism. Also, what is exceptionalism? It's very hard to generalize about the uniqueness of a country and certainly of a region. What is Asian about Asia? Well, there is China, there is Japan, there is India, there is Southeast Asia, even within Southeast Asia, so many different cultures. 
So how can you talk about one set of values, one set of identity? There is diversity not only within a region but with, within a nation even. So you have to be very careful about saying that we are so unique that we no international relations theory can apply to us and we cannot export our theory to outside. There has to be a theory for ourselves. There's a little problem with the Chinese school these days. China is, Chinese scholars are developing a Chinese school of international relations. It's a, it's a very praiseworthy effort. They're trying to challenge the Western dominance. They're trying to have a debate and discourse, very, very vigorous one in China, to develop their study of international relations. But one of the problems I have with the Chinese school is that this Chinese school of IR theory, drawing on Chinese history, Confucianism, tributary system, TNCR, or harmony, who, what does it explain? Does it explain Chinese, China's own foreign policy? or the foreign policy of international relations of East Asia, or does it apply to the rest of the world, the world as a whole? Some people argue that the Chinese critics say that the Chinese are talking about these things because they justify Chinese government's policy of the peaceful rise of China. It kind of feeds into the propaganda of the government about China's peaceful rise. It has a political agenda, but also at the same time, it is trying to justify are trying to explain, even as an explanatory tool, the best it's trying to do is to explain Chinese foreign policy or at most East Asian foreign policy. It's not explaining international relations outside of East Asia, like Africa or world at large. Now, this is a matter of debate. We don't know how the Chinese scholars will come out of this, but if the Chinese school is about Chinese exceptionalism, then it is very narrow and it can be also very dangerous because it will support Chinese sort of dominance and even authoritarianism. But if it can apply to the world as a whole, explain international relations as a whole, then it's very welcome. That's the fifth element. And finally, agency. Global IR recognizes multiple forms of agency beyond material power including resistance, normative action, and local constructions of global order. Now what agency means is uh, the ability to do things, ability to contribute to international politics, the capacity to contribute to international politics, rather than be object, receiving ideas, and uh, the, being the beneficiary of action. Instead of free riding, an agent contributes to the making of global order, a regional order, and international relations. Now, Western IR theory seldom recognizes the agency of non-Western countries. This is very important to bear in mind. So when you talk about, uh, especially after the Second World War period, let's talk about, it. before that it was colonialism, okay. But after the Second World War, who created world order? Well, the answer would be the Americans with a little help from the Europeans. It's the Americans created UN, Americans created IMF, Americans created World Bank, Americans spread the norms of human rights, democracy, liberalism, capitalism. So it's an American world order. Or American led liberal hegemonic order, as John Aiken will put it. The role of other countries, including India, China, or the developing countries, is dismissed. They are seen as objects rather than subjects of international relations. But that's a very narrow view of agency. That's like saying that to be civilized, you must be able to not only have a stable government and protect foreign investment, but be able to fight and win a war and enforce treaties. That's saying that to be civilized means this is the European concept of standard of civilization we had in the 19th century, 18th century. Now, today's conception of agency is based on that sort of a standard of civilization that the West wants to use to colonize the rest. But agency can be multiple. You can, can have normative agency. You cannot, you don't have money. The developing countries have very little material capacity, whether wealth or power, but they can have ideas. So somebody like Mahatma Gandhi could change the world, not because India had a lot of power or wealth, but because it has an idea of non-violence, or Jawaharlal Nehru along with Sukarno and others, could 
create an international movement called Non-Line Movement, which really made a big difference to the way the Cold War unfolded. Through ideas, not through material forces. So agency can be ideational, normative. You can also localize global norms. Just because there is one form of regionalism coming from outside, or security coming from the West, or some sort of moral action, countries in Asia, Africa, and the regions don't simply accept it as it is. They modify, they change, they localize to suit their own context and need. And the act of that modification, changing European regionalism to suit the Asian context, changing sovereignty, European conception of sovereignty to suit Asia, all these are acts of localization, which is a form of agency. I have written a lot about how the concept of sovereignty, the concept of sovereignty, which is an European notion, was modified and expanded and localized in, in Asia. For example, the European classical notion of sovereignty allowed for collective defense, military pacts. But when it came to Asia, in the, at the Bandung Conference, Asian countries led by India, Indonesia, Burma, and uh, Ceylon rejected military pacts. They said collective military pacts are incompatible with strict notion of sovereignty or non-intervention. So the same notion of sovereignty meant something in Europe, something else in Asia. That's localization. That means Asians also had agency. They were contributors, they were actors. They were not objects of Western principles and institutions. They were norm makers themselves. So if you bring in this, the idea of human security, who invented that? A Pakistani economist, Mahababul Haq, with the support of an Indian economist called Amartya Sen. The idea of responsibility to protect, we often credit it to Canadians and Australians. But actually, uh, in a Sudanese diplomat, Francis Deng, who worked in the United Nations and in the US, actually had a lot to do with the cre creation of this idea. We don't give credit to the Sudanese or the Indian and the Pakistanis because the West appropriated the concept of human security and responsibility to protect. But the normative agency, the agency of ideas, was actually not originally in the West. So if you recognize these multiple forms of agency, that agency is not about power and wealth or material capacity and uh, contributions you make out of that, but also ideas, localizations, norms, then you can appreciate that the non-Western countries are not simply objects, but they are actors and subjects of international relations. And then you can have truly global IR, and you can then counter Western dominance in our IR. So to sum up then, global IR has six dimensions, pluralistic universalism, grounding in world or global history, subsuming rather than replacing existing IR theories, but calling on them to expand and enrich themselves with the infusion of the voices, experiences, histories and contributions of non-Western societies and civilizations. Incorporating the study of regions, regionalisms and area studies. Avoiding exceptionalism or cultural exceptionalism or uniqueness and building theories on that sense of exceptionalism. And finally, recognizing multiple forms of agency, including agency in ideas, norms, and uh, localization. Those six elements will help us to address this uh, Western dominance, uh, Western centrism in IR, and can help to move IR towards uh, being a truly global discipline, or global IR. <laughs>